Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining our scheduling hangouts, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today we're going to be continuing some spatial analysis as part of the foundational work for our um, sustainable urban design project. This is a live coding session, it's not a tutorial. I generally try to summarize the work towards the end of the video, uh, but um, basically we'll be figuring things out as we go with a general goal in mind. And today, that goal is to reproduce um, an analysis that I was able to do with QGIS. Essentially, what we've done is uh, taken some OpenStreetMap data and we've loaded it in and filtered it down to select convenience uh, stores and supermarkets. And then we added a buffer around those, dissolved those of around one kilometer. It's a one kilometer buffer to say, you know, this is about how far people would, could be reasonably expected to walk uh, for groceries. So it's a proximity analysis. And with those buffers, we can then select the building footprints and this is actually uh, we've done a secondary analysis here, but um, uh, since we color coded them first by proximity to the groceries, and then we also added bus stops. And with the bus stops, we had a 250 meter buffer we thought was reasonable walking distance to a bus stop. We're just tweaking these parameters essentially. Uh, and what we see here is in purple uh, are the houses that both are within you know a close proximity to a bus stop and a food source they're inside of this greater area of uh, walkability we can tweak all these parameters but the idea here is to build up uh, to a composite analysis to not only just be able to say you know these houses are close to food uh, but to be able to define higher level um, quality of life metrics like livability, basically, um, and it comes in. You know, there's many things that support livability, many different amenities and, and necessities in an urban environment. So what we're going to do is we've got a basic formula to follow, and uh, through quantum GIS, but we need to translate this into Python code, so we can run it on a server and schedule it at a certain interval. And it's kind of hard to to decompose this into tasks because uh, there's a lot of manual steps involved, even just starting from downloading the data. Uh, so just for reference, we're getting the data from Geofabric, DE, and they have a download server. And what they do is they take nightly, I think, uh, snapshots of the OpenStreetMap data and provide it in a couple of useful formats and some tools to get the data into other um, locations like um, if uh, you need it in a database, which we might actually be uh, aiming for, or on a tile server, or in a routing server, like GraphHopper. Graph so I think we'll be coming back to this quite a lot. And what I've got so far today, it was working off stream a little bit. And we created an experimental notebook in Jupyter Lab, and by the way, the source code for this project is on GitHub. It's sustainable urban design slash app. We may rename the repository, <laughs> uh, but in any case, this is our organization. I'm currently working in a branch. So like I said, we're starting off by doing um, some proximity analysis and building up a composite analysis from that. So I'm creating this pull request here. I'll put that in the chat. You can refer back to the changes that were made in the process of this work, as well as other con you know, continuation of this that isn't on this particular stream. Um, so you can just see 
both our environment file and at this point and how to uh, how to run the environment and we're keeping things in a standard IPy notebook we might switch to um, a different format for that for now it's okay though and the goal is to be able to reproduce this quantum JS analysis in pure Python so we might want to just check out the QJS source code And particularly, in particular, we're looking at a couple of tools, but uh, uh, I've gone over this a couple times. I'll just briefly explain what's involved. So we're dealing with different data types in JS. Uh, there's two main categories of data. Um, there's pixel data, sort of like a, a grid of pixels, more or less. Uh, like you've seen this base map, it's called raster data. And that's our OpenStreetMap standard base map there. And then there's these um, geometrical data sets, like points, lines, and polygons that are called vector graphics. And this is not unique to GIS. This is basically how computer graphics works uh, for design and illustration and things like that. There's a lot of common concepts involved. Uh, the main difference is that the coordinate systems for these uh, data are Geographic, they're related to points on Earth, and there's some caveats. There's a lot of different coordinate systems, and that you'll probably see as uh, come to bite us a few times. It's just like a recurring um, challenge. So what we're essentially dealing so there's these two types of data, raster and vector. And we're mainly dealing with vector, and we're creating what's called a geoprocessing pipeline. It's a process that works on geographic data and a series of steps to produce an outcome and put then we need to get it back into the visual realm so we can see it <laughs> and that's what we're going to work on today so essentially i've created a small subset the osm data are huge just for the whole uh, world and really we um let's see let me just double check here something Must have clipped that whole everything for somehow. Hmm. Okay, cool. In any case, the the OSM data you can download for whole, your whole country, <laughs> and it's a lot to work with. Uh, so I just created a, an arbitrary shape, basically, and use it as like a cookie cutter to stamp the data and say, just give me that subset of the clunk. And uh, so now we can work on uh, on smaller things. That's just one of the re also recurring lessons to learn is when you're prototyping and experimenting to start small and. Uh, you know, that way you can fail faster and, and learn faster. And then when you've got something that works, a process that works, then you can start scale it up a little bit and then apply it to a really big data set. Um, yeah. Because you don't want to wait for minutes for um, waiting for a processing algorithm to perhaps never finish that you've done something wrong or have too much data. All right, so essentially I was just looking forward was QGIS. And we do have a few uh, resources here. We might just import PyQGIS and work with the QGIS uh, internals at some point. Right now, I'm trying to keep things simple and work into those um, more uh, either complicated or uh, fully fledged um, libraries and frameworks when we need it, um, rather than just kind of assuming from the get-go that we need something complex. Well, we can use it as a reference. Let me just see if I can find here. I'm not familiar with the, the internals of the QJS. But I think it's pretty well organized. And C++, that's... I suppose it's just buffer. Let's let's look for that. This is probably going to come up a lot in their source. Vector layer buffered up pi. Okay, this is testing it. There we go.
Ah, it's just 68 pages. Ah, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll come back to that. So they do have this nice PyQGIS developer docs. Let's see if we can just find a quick reference in here for, for buffering. Um, essentially, in this notebook, I'll just give a quick um, overview of this. So we've imported uh, some data, just the food sources, those points on the map. Um, I'll need the building footprints. We'll get those in here in a minute. We've got a couple of helper functions. This is for relating, uh, working with geographic data, um, the vector data specifically. Um, Folium is a way to quickly get a map, so you can see the stuff. Uh, it uses uh, leaflet maps. And then GeoPandas is looking pretty cool. It's built with a bunch of tools, and it follows uh, suit uh, with this project called Pandas, which is really nice in the data science, um, data wrangling um, sphere. If you've, uh, for example, ever worked with R language, you know they've got this concept called data frame. And everything you do with a data frame applies to like a whole column. Like you do, you just do an operation and it, it kind of casts it across the whole column. Uh, it's called a vectorized operation because it's working on a vector, or like a dimension in a matrix, I guess. Um, and so GeoPandas does that, but for geographic data. And GeoPandas is built on top of things like um, that are very good ingredients or solid ingredients, but it kind of puts them together in a, a nice package. Uh, so I'm kind of getting getting a sense of how things are organized in. Python Geospatial Land. I haven't done extensive work um, with Python Geospatial Programming. Uh, so let's just go to Control F and buffer. Modifying vector layers, modifying vector layers and adding a buffer. So the thing is, this word layers is loaded. I believe it means like a QGIS layer. And we're uh, not necessarily going to want to work with QGIS layers. They might have just a little bit too much baggage. but. I could be wrong here, but yeah, see, so you've got things like Map Canvas. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of this is expecting you to work, you know, either with a QGIS plugin or directly in the Python console, which gives you access to the whole <laughs> a running QGIS instance. It's pretty cool, and you can essentially make your plugin here and then package it up and uh, install it through the uh, plugin manager. Um, but again, that's um, this is a web-based application, so what we are going to produce here needs to essentially distilled down to just Python code that could run uh, periodically or on, dem on command, it depends. All right, so unfortunately, um, QGIS PyQGIS developer cookbook won't be useful to us right now. Uh, so just to s continue going over this file though, we, we have the data in a subfolder. The notebook is an IPython notebook. And we've got a conda environment and a basic readme to get people up and running. So you can try to get this, uh, pro you know, test this project at home. Uh, we point um, to the file and we tell GeoPandas to load it. It just does it for us. We don't have to <laughs> really handle that. That's one of the nice things about pandas and geopandas, I guess by extension, is they just, it does a lot of things, a lot of things kind of magically, <laughs> really simply. Good layer of abstraction there. Uh, one problem that this GeoJSON data, when I export it from QGIS, it's in um, what it's called a coordinate reference system. And basically, uh, those are just grids that are overlaying on the Earth. And the Earth is, uh, just this is obvious, but just for context, the Earth is a th like a three-dimensional sort of spherical body, and in order to take that spherical shape, um, more or less the surface of the Earth, and to put it into two dimensions to display on a screen or in a map, you have to um, kind of project it. So you can imagine holding a flashlight and shining it against your hand, and the ref and the projection on the wall is is sort of um, you know similar to your hand, but in some ways distorted. If you change the, if you pivot your hand to change the angle and things, you know, your fingers might disappear. Um, so the good analogy here is this, of a, that of an orange peel, because it's a close approximation to the way that they have, the surface of the Earth needs to unwrap and be kind of stretched. Hey, Rich, welcome. Good seeing you. And so the reason I'm bringing up these map projections is because Anytime you're dealing with spatial data, just like anytime you're looking at a calendar on the wall, 
you're dealing with a grid like a, f a space or time it's different measurements and different calendars have different like you got Gregorian calendar and uh, Julian calendar and uh, lunar and solar calendars I'm sure there are many different ways that people have measured time and it's the same thing with geographic data and so again this can come back to bite us but the first and the first way it's relevant is that when we display data in folium on a map it is working with latitude and longitude coordinates so those are kind of radial degrees around the sphere and an x and y latitude longitude and latitude uh, axes um, so it's like n 90 and 180 degrees negative 90 to 90 and negative 180 to 180 something like that uh, around it uh, and the problem with this is the a degree at the equator is not the same distance as a degree towards the pole as you get towards the top the poles of the earth the degrees start to skew and shift uh, what's that called a um, Mac reticule And uh, this, uh, this might even be showing us the distances. So basically, when we measure distance, we want some kind of uniform measurement uh, of that distance that we can compare across um, different countries or, or things like that. So there's the, um, one projection that's very common and that is used de facto for web mapping. It's called the Web Mercator projection, and that's is what we're going to be. Uh, there's lots of different projections. There's an XKCD on this. Um, just to, it's, you know, just to be funny and uh, show some interesting uh, pe peculiarities of map projections. I don't want to get too far off the mark here, but uh, this Mercator projection is what we're going to be aiming for, a web Mercator version of it. Um, and these are all just different ways that the surface of the Earth can be unfolded. So when we come over here to Folium, um, I'm going to need to be working in the same coordinate system. Otherwise, your data won't, it's like in different dimensions, you know, you're just in different households. If you're not measuring things the same, you can't really navigate. So. The data in Q QGIS over here is in this web mercator or pseudo mercator um, projection. So that means it, it's basically you're able to measure meters and distance um, kind of continuously. And when we get it over into folium, we just have to reproject it into lat long degrees. So this will come up in a minute. But essentially, the, at the end of the day, you know, we just uh, in the previous live coding session, we were able to. to um, load this GeoJSON data, reproject it, and display it in a folium map. You know, folium is not the end goal, and having it in lat long is not necessarily the end goal. The end goal is to have um, a visual outcome similar to this, where we can color code things and start doing composite analysis, uh, livability analysis, basically. Once you can do this in one city using OpenStreetMap data, I believe the same sort of geoprocessing pipeline or, or a method sh should be portable to different cities. And that's one of the goals is to let people see their own home city. Uh, so I'm working here in Tampere because this is where I live. What you been up to, Rich? Anything, anything new, exciting? So again, just we've got bus stops, we've got food sources, we've got 250 meter buffer around the bus stops for walkability. That's you know a nice, not too bad of a distance. 250 meters is not too far to walk, and then we've got a one kilometer buffer around the food sources. Maybe that you know these could be tweaked, and we're color coding based on membership or intersection in this case because it's actually the, the geometry is just intersecting that corner there. For food sources, 
you have to be a member, you have to be inside of this set, the set of coordinates encompassed by this dissolved geometry around the food sources. So only the houses that are fully within this. Again, I could have done intersection there. And for the transport buffer, we just did the intersection so it, it can split. And then we took the union of those two sets and um, colored it to say that this is a little bit more livable. Your amenities are more accessible. And the ones that aren't are colored orange, they might need attention, a design intervention. And there's whole neighborhoods that, uh, you know, there's no food, no, no transport really serving these neighborhoods. And sometimes there's not even any sidewalks, right? So that's a whole other thing. There's lots of layers of analysis we can put into this. We just got to get the moving parts and make it uh, reproducible. All right, wide area network. SD, what's SD? Okay, so I think at this point, we have this, this GeoPandas data frame, and let's just take a look at it. Uh, you actually want to hit shift in there, or it's a control enter. How do you add a, a new row? And let me make sure I got all my imports, everything is ready, and paste this in there, and we'll look at the head which is just the first few rows. Uh, so pandas and geopandas basically are tabular data, multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, I guess you call them vectors, I'm not sure. I'm not very mathematical. But in any case, each, they, each feature has a, a unique identifier. Each row has a unique identifier in the geopandas or pandas pointer reference. And these feature IDs, I believe they came from QGIS. And then OSM IDs come from OpenStreetMap. So there's like three levers, layers of identity here. Uh, code, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's something relating to the feature class, which is what we're after. That's the human readable representation of that code, perhaps. The name is the actual name of the point, the point of interest. And then this is a way of representing geometry called a well-known format, WKF. It's a multipoint. And you can see these coordinates. This is X and Y coordinates in this web Mercator coordinate system. This is where you can literally see the difference between lat long pairs, which we're pretty familiar with. You can look up like the web coordinates for a city nearby you. And uh, you know, it's these decimal degrees but we're not so used to seeing these web mercator decimal degrees. They're, they're usually, uh, they're, uh, or web mercator coordinates, they're usually hidden from us. Software defined wide area network. All right. That sounds cool. So rather than using kind of like hardware circuitry to configure the network, you have like an onboard uh, micro kernel or some kind of a embedded operating system to configure the radio frequencies and do channel switching or, or, or whatever uh, is necessary for the wide area network and uh, encryption and probably authentication, those types of things. Is that what the software does? And maintaining the, this is like a mesh or what kind of um, topology, how do the, how do the uh, nodes intercommunicate and organize? All right, so the cool thing is I've already kind of cut some corners here with um, QGIS, and I just exported some prepared data. We're going to buffer this. So I have this, um, each column in a data frame is called like a series or vector. And I think there's this operation right in GeoPandas that lets us create a buffer. Because as you recall, for each of those food sources, we had a uh, uh, one kilometer buffer, something like that. It, I don't think people are gonna walk more than a kilometer each way to get groceries home. And so this is going to return a series, which is like a vector or like a, a big long list of things that are geographic, geographic. 
So I think the distance would be in the unit of the column. So we want to make sure we're in that web mercator so we're able to operate in meters, metric distance, uh, or units. I'll have to see if it lets us specify the unit. Let's give it a try. So basically, we just take this buffer method. And before converting the data, th I did this whole conversion so that we could map it in Folium. But you know, it's probably not necessary for the most part. So let's go ahead and buffer the data. Do you say data or data? I've, I've still never figured that one out. Uh, and then we, I guess we will have to reproject it to get it into this folium map. So let's give it a try. Um, I think we, if we just say one, one kilometer, what was the second argument? Resolution, 16. And it's got a default there. And another cool thing about um, pandas, uh, sorry, um, Jupyter Lab is it's getting more and more like an IDE. Let me just remember how we do this. Control space, control tab. Control tab. No, that's browser tab. Now there's shift tab. We'll get you your doc string uh, with, depending on how well documented the library is, even uh, some examples in there. So the distance is a flow to NumPy array or a pandas series. So yeah, this is just inheriting from pandas. Uh, the radius of the buffer, if NP array or PD series are used, it must have the same length as the geo series. Okay, so you can add a specific buffer for each item in the geo series, or you can add a single uh, scalar value uh, to be applied to each item in the series. It'll be cast along that series. I think one, and hopefully this is one, it's probably one meter. And, you, and then you can see the output here is just uh, uh, a series of polygons in the well-known text format. And what to do with that series? Well, let's capture it. Buffered food sources. Cool, now we got that. And in order to get it into Folium, we have to convert it to the right um, coordinate reference system and then put it in a format that Folium's used to working with, GeoJSON in this case. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Uh, we'll do, first you reproject it, we'll go ahead and do both of these. And I'll just give it the same name so it's easier to read. Tampara food sources buffered and then Tampara food sources, 4326. It's a little bit, sometimes I do this, I get real verbose with my names. Um, you know, this is mutable. I could just override the original one with the, the new value, but in any case. That's just one of my that's one of my things I do. I just have really long variable names. All right, so now we got those converted and we're just gonna drop them down to, to JSON. And here you go again. But the cool thing is now we've got a pretty big memory footprint, potentially if you've got a lot of data, in multiple formats and multiple um, kind of data uh, memory chunks, but now we can add it. So I've got, uh, when we create the map, we just, I got these coordinates from Google. We create a Folium map, which is just a mapping library for Python uh, that uses leaflet. Oh, let's see, SD WAN, it's always hub and spoke. This is because, ah, okay, yeah. Hmm. Have you worked with mesh networking much? I used to have, we used to run, in fact, I helped implement a mesh uh, wireless, uh, campus-wide mesh network. 
in California, and I worked at a company in Lawrence, Kansas, called Lawrence Freenet, and we were doing city municipal kind of quasi um, quasi well, community oriented um, network deployment. And I think that was a mesh topology as well. Well, yeah, we were using. Uh, at the Woolman School, when I did it, we got a bunch of these, uh, I think, Meraki, Meraki devices, something like that. And we just flashed them with this mesh firmware. I'm having trouble, I haven't done that stuff in a while. It was pretty interesting, there were a lot of challenges, and basically it turned into my full-time gig is troubleshooting the network. We brought in, I don't know if I've told you this already, but we were in, it was a rural school, and the only option was satellite internet. But the DSL terminated like up the hill about uh, probably about 500 meters to a kilometer up the hill, and so we beamed it down with some directional antennas and created a mesh network on the whole rest of the campus. It was a pretty, pretty cool project. Batman, I remember looking that up. Uh, Alfred did some information across the nodes, yeah. Uh, was it Meraki, or what are those other? Oh yeah, then Cisco bought these. Um, I guess. Meraki was what I used in Lawrence, Kansas. It was like this uh, pretty simple way to get a little ho uh, home mesh network set up. Um, but what are those high, those, uh, high gain? Um, not a Yagi. What were we using? Ubiquity. We were just using Ubiquity devices and we were flashing them. Yeah, we had some of these uh, Ubiquity and I think TP-Link, we were looking at these as well. But yeah, we went up, this one was our long haul down the hill. And then we had some of these uh, Omni devices and we had like a back channel, a couple of more directional antennas to go out from the central node in the office. The signal went down the hill to the office and then had a, some omnis and repeaters set up on different channels. It was cool, man. And that network is still operational. Uh, that was all. That was ten years ago. Pretty cool. All right. So now we've got some new data. And the cool thing is, you know, f these web maps. You can just put layers on them, and they're interactive. Uh, they're, so they're not static. So it's kind of fun seeing things uh, and interacting with them. So we're just going to create a new uh, uh, GeoJSON layer. That's why we converted to JSON here. This all might not be necessary. There could be a way to uh, feed Folium a GeoPandas uh, data frame directly. I don't know. But in any case, this is what I figured out. Let me just get this here for reference. And we're going to save it. We're going to copy and paste, because that's how I code. Buffers. Okay, now we've uh, modified our map. I can't get this uh, tooltip to work either. It's a little bit frustrating. And we're going to render the map, and it broke. Um, yes, I just. I'm not going to mess with the tooltips. You know, when part of the um, interactivity should be that you can inspect and get information about each node. Ah, oh, crud. Oh, 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 here we go. Ah, uh, because I'm feeding the tooltip. I copy it, so this is the bane of copy and paste coding existence. All right, what am I doing wrong now? Foods for me. Okay, does that look good? Uh, let me just go ahead and recreate that map. Something that might be stuck in cache. All right, so we've got GeoJSON add to map. So it's almost like the map. Hmm. Something to do with styling. The features. Yeah, something got messed up here. Let me just reset the kernel. 
It's also kind of a challenge with these net, uh, notebook environments is the order that you run the code, uh, something that looks like linearly after something before it, uh, can be run before it. There's no, you know, like I can run this cell, and then I can run this cell. But this cell depended on that cell, and that hence it got an error there. So it kind of, you know, can add a layer of confusion there. Overall, I like working with notebooks. I don't think that they're altogether the wrong thing, like some um, people have kind of portrayed them as. There we go. So that's, that was the deal, something in the cache. Uh, and it looks like we had buffers, too. I'm just zoomed really far out. But yeah, I'm glad. So that's step A. Now I know how to buffer uh, using GeoPandas. Uh, next thing is dissolving these buffers, because as you know, uh, notice probably there's a bunch of overlapping circles here. Batman, Alfred, disseminate information across the nodes. Yeah, let's see, what did we flash onto those? It was actually a pretty usable operating system. Ba Batman, from what I remember, was like really low level. You have to like, be really Linuxy or Unixy and do all these text base configuration stuff. Open source. The it was like called open mesh or something like that. It's probably built on Batman, but it's like an, a layer above it or something. Mm. You can flash it onto these. You can flash onto these devices. Libre mesh, no. Uh, open WRT, but no, that's not what we're using. Awesome mesh, yeah, there we go. Mm, software. And Meraki. Yeah, I can't remember though, but yeah, we were able to flash the same basically firmware on all of the devices and they meshed together and you had to configure um, I can't even remember all the terminology, but you had to configure one as like the sort of controller and then the others would um, follow suit or something, but then network together. Yeah, I wish I could remember that. In any case, that's not what I'm doing now. Geographic stuff now. So let's dissolve, dissolve, dissolve. There's just an operation on it right there. Unary union method on all geometries in the group self. Some of this documentation, man, is really dense. And the goal, like one of the high level goals, I keep saying this, but it's so important, is that urban design and analysis shouldn't be steeped in this kind of level of detail of like meshing, uh, uh, buffering and dissolving and projections and all that stuff. It's just not very user friendly. All right, so we're gonna dissolve these though in case. There's a nice button for it in QGIS. When I go to plug vector geoprocessing tools and I create a buffer around them, you just take your input layer, all these points. I've got several layers in here, but let's just say uh, the traffic lights and you can say you know buffer distance and there's a checkbox dissolve result and what that does is it creates the nice continuous circles rather than having all the overlapping circles let me just hide some of these other layers 
Yeah, you can kind of see. It looks pretty, I mean. Could almost be something you'd hang on the wall. Almost. <laughs> All right, so let's buffer these. Do that, we wanna come back up here. Create buffers. Um, let's create a section so that we're sort of being literate here and at least ha having top level headers dissolve buffers. The nice thing about that is we get this table of contents because the latest, some at some point recently at least, uh, Jupyter Lab has got a nice uh, inbuilt plugin manager. Whereas typically before you had to install plugins by the command line in your repo root, now it'll just let you browse and install them directly here. So I installed this table of contents plugin, and uh, it just automatically creates an outline based on the d various levels of headers and maybe even yeah, it auto numbers the things if you want to print it and look more kind of academic. All right, so we're gonna dissolve these buffers. I think we can just add another. <laughs> Whatever that would be called, buffer, uh, dissolve. Oh, you can have your own groupings, so that's pretty cool. I don't know practically what it would be useful for, but for example, in the food analysis right now, we're looking at at least two, if not three different types of food sources in neighborhoods. Grocery stores, which are pretty much the big ones that have multiple aisles, you got fresh produce and everything there, like the large stores. Then you've got convenience stores, which can vary in size from like medium, almost super, uh, almost a grocery store, down to like the corner market that mainly sells soda and candy, and maybe a couple of bananas on the counter. And then we have green grocers, which aren't very common here in Tampa. I don't think there was any real examples of those. And the idea is basically we want people to be able to get fresh produce and a full s selection of food, so convenience stores aren't necessarily the most ideal food source. In fact, you can have, you can be living in a food desert and have convenience stores around you, but no real access to quality food. It's just fast food and um, low quality, high carbohydrate, uh, fatty, processed, you know, chips and things like that from convenience store. But the, what I'm getting at is that. This buy function lets us say, all right, let's put different parameters and say, show us the convenience stores, maybe set a little bit larger of a radius, uh, or the radius and buffering would have already been done, but it would allow us to buffer and group the grocery stores separately from uh, convenience stores. Yeah, again, I don't know quite how that's useful, but. This is how we roll, we just gotta learn and Absorb. So then that shift tab probably would give us a shift tab. Control tab. The same information except that's been run. It should know. Anyway, let's run it. Uh, that's why there's no. Ah, uh, so it's a geo series. Uh, okay. And this is operating on the whole data frame, which is multiple series. Okay. Well, one thing I can do then, I see. Because I really want to dissolve this uh, series, these buffers. Hmm. Yeah, 
And so shapely buffer from which this is inheriting doesn't have the notion of dissolve. It's hmm, pretty cool though. This could be what we're after though. This union, and that could be applied on, I'm guessing it could be applied on a Geo Pandas Geo series. A unary union. Yeah. Let's give it a try. That's the one we're after, I think. So we'll call it union. So is this a multiplayer object? No, 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 it's not actually. I wanted to. So I have a couple options. One is I can assign this. Uh, I think this returns a series. So each of those is a geometry polygon. What is it? Just uh, property it should be a method, huh? It did just work. And it pr uh, plotted it right off the bat, so that's cool. So yeah, it's not callable. Yes, I okay. That's so. This is the multi polygon object. Turns a single multi polygon geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now with the geometry. Maybe I can just turn this geojson ge directly. Just to check it out. Before reprojecting it. Yeah, yeah, I could have checked that. So multi-polygon object. Does it have any methods? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is unfortunate. There's errors on the screen.
Here we go. To WKT, to well-known text. WKB well-known binary, something like that. Yeah, we just got to get it in a format that we can pass into Folium. Or well, that we can reproject and then pass into Folium. See what happened. There it is. Now the thing is, this two CRS method is on uh, a Geo Pandas data frame. So I'm not sure how to reproject this. I got to get to. I think I'll have to dive to a little bit lower level library here. And what what type is this? A shapely geometry multi polygon. Okay. I don't think Shapely has an idea of CRS, coordinate reference systems. Because Shapely is just working with geometries. Oh. And you have to use a library like proj. Right. Or Fiona might have that capability working on top of OGS. PyProj. All right, so I'll just set the CRS. This gives us the actual transformations for each coordinate, but I want to just use a library that applies it.
missing here? The main way of working with coordinate reference systems on shapely geometries doesn't have to be shapely, but uh, either well known text or GeoJSON. Raster or using vector. And that's for working on the whole data frame. No, that's not what we're after. Although, what if we we can't change the CRS before we buffer? Change it before we dissolve. Hmm. That's setting it, but now we're reprojecting a little bit. Let me just see if this series has a method. This is cool. Representative point might be interesting uh, if we want to reduce polygons down to a single point. For example, doing like a kernel density uh, function, something like that. All right, this shouldn't be so hard. Okay, so shapes the opposite transform. Can you do the little pipe? Yeah, I'm using very common coordinate systems.
Okay, so I was really close. I just backed off. Uh, shapely transformer is the answer, and uh, this is good. Good response. Let's check our imports. All right, so we've got that. That's our initial geometry. Copy and paste. Just remove some ambiguity. Our source is over here in QGIS 3857 Web Mercator. Actually, let me just check the project dependencies. 
It's getting a little bit annoying. Oh, there we go. Not sure if maybe we've got some global environment issue. That's should be the case though. I'm in, I'm in a condo environment, I don't know. All right, let me just see. Ah, it's 1.9.6. Okay, so something I added subsequently didn't, or downgraded PyProj. That's one thing I don't really like about Conda, is that it doesn't automatically upgrade, update your um, dependency file. You have to manually export that, so things can change. All right. And the only reason, I'm, honestly, that I'm using Conda, I've been really hesitant to use Conda, uh, but, but I could not get the GeoData abstraction library GDAL to install. If we don't end up using it, though, I'm not going to use Conda. I can figure out how to get that. Uh Hopefully it's using Sember, it'll just install the latest in that series. What would be holding that package back? Could be the Geo Pandas.
Yeah, because so far we haven't needed the o OGR at all. I'm not sure how much we're going to manipulate these. <sighs> Geopendence is quite capable. What does OGR bring, though? We don't need to create these geometries necessarily. I can iterate uh, over. Oh I think I can use Shapely, perhaps, to iterate. Yeah, all right, so here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> A little bit of an aside, I'm going to drop this. Uh, the desire to uh, work with OGRs coming from this book I'm reading uh, from Manning, it's called Geoprocessing with Python. It's pretty good. I like Manning books, um, and it's using this OGR. So at this, at the beginning, when I kicked off this notebook project, I was not using Conda, and I prefer not to use Conda now. But I could not install OGR. I don't want other developers to have to go through that struggle. is okay and stuff but I'd rather perhaps use um, like poetry or something something a little closer to the Python pi p, um, pip way of doing things oh, I mean it's pretty powerful and it did make installing OGR real easy to see what the conflict is. I'm out of tea. Okay. A whole bunch of conflicts. Okay, here's here we go. Here we go. Uh, I'm getting tired. I was trying to exit out of the virtual environment. a little bit of it another try this is a GPL three or later
say 3.7. Shouldn't be a problem if people need to run 3.7. What did we end up using? Jupiter Lab. Oh, I closed it. Hmm. Pull request. Again, if anyone checking the stream wants to see the changes that were involved in this pull request or shortly after, a little bit of floundering, um, figuring things out, switching mainly between tooling. Uh, and heck, I'm, if I can, I'll uninstall Conda. I'm just that kind of unenthusiastic about um, using it. All right, so we're using Folium, OSGO, oh, PyProj. Ah, no, no, we're not using this one. That's the problem. We're Folium, though. GeoPandas. Might have a lot of top level dependencies in there for us. Eventually, we'd like to use PostGIS. GeoFeather, what's that? Oh, Feather's like a data format, isn't it? Folium. Shape is going to be in there because GeoPandas um, PyProj might not be, might make it a top of the dependency. Here's the moment of truth. And poetry can do it. What are we at? One and a half hours almost. A lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. All right, so I'm going to remove that environment. Uh, Change it, I suppose. We don't want that. And 
here's the moment of truth. Some warnings. Some internal things. All right, so we've reprojected it. Jason, all right. Mm. Right, uh, I think I can add it just as WKT. So I just need to check volume for WKT method. Just kind of these little snafus. People should not have to experience this when they want to do urban design. <laughs> so that's cool. It's a multi polygon object. Shapely multi polygon. Right. <laughs> there it is. Uh, whoa, where did we go? Single item geo series. To Jason. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of a dance, but uh, all right, I get it. Not too bad. I'll add comments and na uh, meaningful variable names. So I'll just put that there for a second.
Hope it works. Did it. That's good for tonight. We've got those, a uh, couple of the steps complete. Um, the next thing, you know, some of this I can probably just do in post GIS and forget about all this. Um, just different libraries and stuff. I think post GIS has all these, most of these functions. Geo within is the next step. We're going to look at uh, intersection and containment within those um, buffer zones of convenience. Um, let me just see post GIS. I mean, you can create buffers around points, ST buffer. I'm thinking, as much as I like Python, and it's very powerful and very rich ecosystem, even the GeoPandas has direct interfaces for PostGIS. If I lean on PostGIS, get a local Docker uh, container going or something, make it easy for other developers. I, I want to make this project accessible for other developers. Uh, so it should just be one command to get an, a development environment running, something like that. Or a few commands, not too much, but well documented. Uh, yes, then we could leverage PostGIS. Post because then you've got PostGIS within. I guess this... Ah, uh, for, for completely inside. I think you could probably use multi polygons. Like a geometric tree collection, I guess. Hmm. So it's looking good. Um, and it's optimized, it's powerful. It's a single interface for all these functions, not having to worry about juggling libraries necessarily, uh, figuring out all their nuances <laughs> and getting a complicated development environment set up. So yeah, I think that's going to be a path to take soon. But in any case, I'm glad to have this progress so far. This code, I'll commit and push to GitHub. And I've given the updates to... Actually, I'm uh, not super excited about Conda anyway, but they did answer the question. This is a good one. So these commits will be appearing on GitHub shortly. Let me just, so I'm going to delete the Conda environment. Consider uninstalling Conda from the computer. <laughs> we'll go to. Uh, there's. I don't have the Git integration here, but okay. So we'll go to Git in the command line. Make sure everything's saved. a little bit on these environments. I do prefer poetry. I would like to use just pip. I think pip is going to have some of the nice features that poetry uh, includes, particularly the um, constraint solver. I like poetry that it, it's already aligning with things like the Pi Project HOML. And it uses pip underneath, I believe. Oh, we're going to add a git ignore. Just ignore that directory. Yeah. 
I'll include directory uh, uh, instructions in the readme about how to get this data because mm, that was not trivial. We have working buffer. With um, what was that called? It was dissolved, but they called it something else. Very cool. Changes are pushed. Uh, see if it renders that folio map. Yeah. Interesting. What was the name of that union convert coordinates? to go. All right. Well, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding hangout. We've got a little bit of um, some uh, comments and mentions uh, from Rich. It's nice to see you again, Rich. Again, this project is open source on GitHub. Feel free to stop by. Uh, we're trying our best to be developer, um, like open to any types of contributors. Uh, you don't have to be a developer. I'm uh, a little bit tired, so I'm stumbling for words, but basically, uh, all contributors are welcome to this project. You don't have to be uh, interested in code. You can be coming at it from a um, design standpoint, research standpoint. We need help with um, kind of out outreach, community building, lots of ways. Um, and we would really appreciate anybody's uh, contribution. If you're interested in this or other open source projects, stop by codebuddies.org. There's a lot of good study groups and hangouts on a regular basis. There's tons of hangouts. Uh, almost every day there's several, uh, from what I can tell, or at least a few a week. And you can get involved with the rewrite of the CodeBuddies.org platform. We're building it. Uh, I should say the developers are building it from the ground up. I'm mainly focused on other projects, but they're using, um, from what I can tell, it's going to be a Django backend and a React frontend. So if you're interested in learning either of those projects or frameworks, and getting involved in an open source project at the ground level, hop on by codebuddies.org or github.com slash codebuddies. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you're doing well out there. Have a great day.